So here it is, just picked it up from the Freightline Company. Uh, well packaged here from uh, Stop Your Trailer. You can see it's three large boxes and actually on a pallet. Uh, based on where I live, they wouldn't deliver it via 18-wheeler, which wouldn't fit to where I'm at. So I needed to go pick it up from the freight center. Uh, I think it was shipped out on Friday and was in on Monday afternoon. So definitely some rapid transport from Florida up to where I'm at. So before I get anywhere near the camper, the first thing I'm going to do is kind of clean things up from how they shipped. This hard brake line right here came in this bag. But you can see right here, it, it actually punctured through before it ever uh, made it to me. And of course, it didn't ship with caps on the end of here either, which is a little concerning to me. So just to be extra safe, I've got my air compressor fired up, and I'm actually going to blast some air through here, make sure that there's nothing hanging out in those lines, and then I'm just going to lightly tape up the ends of it. So as I stretch this out and fit it into place, I'm not doing it, shoving dirt down inside of either of these holes, because you definitely don't want any contamination inside of your brake line. Another thing that I'm going to do before I even pull the camper up into the area is take a look at the bearings. So the inner bearings shift in their own package right here, kind of covered up and protected from everything. These outer bearings were actually just in a bag with all of the other hardware. Again, I don't think that's exactly the best, so what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to hit everything, the ones that were in the bag, the ones that weren't in the bag, before I pack these bearings. I'm going to hit them with a little bit of brake parts cleaner um, and just make sure that these are nice and clean and no issues uh, before I pack them. So the general sequence of things is I'm going to get some stuff cleaned up, I'm going to pack the bearings, I'm going to pack these bearings, and then we'll get out the uh, rotors themselves and take a look at them. So my method here is I just have a little bit of scrap plastic and I'm just lightly hitting this around here just to kind of flush out anything. And also there might be residual oils from the manufacturing process uh, that, that I'd rather just make sure that I'm getting good bonding between the grease. So I'm gonna do this to all eight bearings. So for those of you that think I might be overdoing it a bit here, you can actually see inside of here. It's not dots behind the cardboard, that's actual gunk that was inside of the bearing um, that I'm glad that I've been able to flush out of there. You can kind of see those flakes and flecks floating all down through all of there. All of that was inside of these bearings. So still working on my prep work here. Um, I believe in doing all this before you even have the camper in the area. So you're really taking your time, not rushing yourself, doing it right. These are the sort of things that you can do in the garage or in the shop, um, you know, where you can make it a little more comfortable. And you know, these are really where you wanna demonstrate some care. So this is one of the rotors that comes with it. I've got it flipped upside down. I have just kind of wiped out the inside of it to make sure that there's no little paint flakes and blown some air through here. And the next step is I've packed all the bearings with grease. Uh, there's lots of different ways. I mean, there's a million videos on YouTube about packing these things by hand or whatever. Um, I used this device right here. Very easy to get off of Amazon. All you do is put the bearing in between there. Just hand tighten it down. Your Zerk adapter fits right on there. And you can just basically pump the grease through it and then just give the outer uh, bearings a little wipe down. So what we're going to do is we are going to set, and I'm not going to make the video of this part because I want to use both of my hands to make sure that I'm getting it in there good, but I'm going to drop the bigger inner bearing. you got your outer bearings, the little guys, and the inner bearings, the big guys. You're going to, It's only going to fit there in one way. It'll be pretty obvious when it's in front of you that this is conically shaped. So we're going to fit it in conically, and then we're going to actually go ahead and press in this dust cover. Uh, you see a lot of people using wood blocks to do this. I don't really like that because you can see that the seal is actually pretty much right on the border of plus and the last thing I want to do is put a little nick or anything in that seal. So I actually have a very large socket and I've seen that and I'm going to just use that socket to only make contact with this outer portion here. Uh, I'll try and make a video of, of how I'm going to do that. So I want to show everyone how we're doing this. So I've actually got my uh, eight-year-old helping me right here. So go ahead and start squeezing. And so after I've pressed in this bearing, you can see that I'm going to work this thing around and squeeze in and actually fill all the way around here and keep squeezing until it fills up that cavity inside of there. And this is one of those things where, you know, doing it yourself, you know that it's being done right because no one cares about your trailer more than you do. So I'm going to go all the way around here and then we'll flip it around. So now I've flipped this over and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to squeeze 
and put grease all around that inner portion of that bearing inside of there too. And then I'm gonna put an initial run of grease around here. I'm actually not gonna put this bearing in. I think it's a whole lot easier to slide these on with the outer bearing off and then pop it on. Um, and I'm pretty sure that my axles have the easy lube zerk on them right here to fill the rest of the cavity for everything else. So that's something that I'm not gonna do for now. I'm not gonna fill the very inner portion of this because I think there's a tool on the camper to do that. Um, if that's not the case, then I'll, I'll update the video and show how to do that. Another thing that I'm doing as part of my prep steps is I wasn't the biggest fan of how this bracket right here came uncoated. So I'm getting this with a, just a little bit of spray paint just to make sure that it doesn't rust and just so that it doesn't look so ugly in the compartment. So I thought I'd start here today with uh, what I was able to get done yesterday in about a half a day. Uh, I started with wanting to really nail down where I wanted the pump to be at. So I do I wanted it generally on the right hand side of the camper because of just the left hand side is so weighed down with the kitchen and all the bathrooms and just there's a general imbalance on that side. So I knew I wanted it on the right hand side uh, and that's the side that I wanted to run the brake lines down. Not that it would make a huge difference, but every little thing helps also. I also knew I wanted it out of the way, and generally I wanted it in the front compartment, you know, where we've got the batteries and everything else. Um, but of course, wanting to be as out of the way as possible, I uh, really tried to squeeze it up here in this front compartment here. Um, and I wanted to mount it to metal. Um, so there's actually this crossbar behind here. And I found out that I could get the bracket on there. And I had to add an, a different hole to this bracket, but it's no big deal to drill a different, different hole into it. And then I was actually able to tap the backside of this bracket right here to get this mounted into here. Uh, what's kind of weird is my kit did not come with any hardware besides the plate to mount into anything behind here or to mount the pump itself. Um, I haven't reached out to Bill yet to understand if that's standard or if that's a mistake. Luckily I had just some extra bolts lying around that would fit so I got this all mounted up correctly. Um, have not done the wiring yet. I'll post later about the wiring. Uh, one interesting thing that I did find was back behind here, there is a pass-through hole, just a little plug. And so I've popped that out and I'm gonna try and incorporate that in so that I'm not actually cutting another hole to the outside from this area. Uh, some advantages I think from doing it in here is it's protected. All my other stuff inside of here is not gonna get in the way of this. Leaves me plenty of room for doing any sort of battery upgrades or anything like that in the future along this that I'm not tying up that real estate. Uh, and really the only kind of disadvantage to this is that I'll just have to run some extra wire through some uh, COT, you know, protectant over to here. But that should be really no big deal at all in a total comparison of this project. So moving to the outside. This is definitely not new to me, but I've got to say that I could never have done it without it is removing the tray right here. And I don't have it fully pulled out. I just popped it up above, but getting this tray out to be able then to straighten the brake lines out. Now, of course, I'm not done. I'm leaving my coil right here as I work out my final method. And then to actually snake it down through, I'm taking advantage on my particular unit. These brackets right here let's see if I can zoom in there and get it to focus these brackets right here all have a hole that is just big enough for the hose and then the retainer nut to pass through with it and I've actually been able to snake the entire unit all the way down along these all the way down to the brake line the only one that did not work out is actually the one right in the up front here and that's because there's some factory damage of course it looks like when they shot this um through it kind of overall bent this down and i tried bending it up a little bit and definitely couldn't get it and bending it down isn't going to work either because it's contacting right there so i may at this very end have to do a loop down and back up uh, to get that final brake line but that'll actually eat up some length i do have the equipment to cut and reflare um, but if not necessary, it wouldn't break my heart to not have to do that. So 
So moving down right here, you can see where I've got one installed. I actually put the wheel on last night because we had some friends over and they'd never seen the unit before. So I was leveling it uh, to let them inside. But uh, up inside of here, I have not actually shot anything down yet. Um, because I want to kind of get my flexible hoses in the optimal positions so I'm still kind of working that out and tying everything together and then I will uh, set the hard line protectants in. I also went ahead and wrapped my um, flexible lines all in what we call COT other people call loom just you know kind of probably depends on your industry but um, I wrapped all of them in that just as an extra level of protection um, so that's where we're at this morning, and then I'll be doing some more updates. Uh, in general, mounting the pump took me the most time yesterday, um, just because in terms of getting the taps right and getting the exact position right and, you know, just normal slowness on my part. Um, and then running the brake line wasn't too bad, and you can see even the extra uh, solid piece I was able to run down in the exact same fashion. Uh, I think it's going to be really well protected up there. I'm also going to go back and put some COT around it um, as well, just because I'm that obsessive. Um, in order, in terms of jacking, I actually picked up a new jack right here. Got this Unijack. They, again, I'm not sponsored by anyone. They aren't paying me at all. I didn't get a discount or anything, but this was a really, really easy way to jack the unit up uh, and it feels really solidly built. Um, you can see where I've got my soft lines that I've run down, uh, partially down there last night. I, um, of course, using looking at all the different forums on how to do this, you know, I ran across these metal band hangers right here that have the clips built in. Obviously, it's not going to be in that down position. It's just loose right now as I get things adjusted. But I think that those metal brackets are a really much nicer way of doing it than zip ties uh, long term. My general goal was no zip ties on the brake system. I really wanted everything to be hard mounted. So that's where we're at right now. I'm gonna probably take off the opposite side over there now. I'm gonna go ahead and do that one. And my reason for that is that I wanna make sure that as I run this soft brake line across the axle tube here, am I really placing the three-way in the optimal position based on where those brakes end up. So that's where I'm gonna go next. Get that one off honestly take i'll do one video on taking off a hub and axle i haven't decided which one because it gets kind of messy maybe one i can get one of my kids to hold the camera for but uh it's it's easy to do uh, especially on a unit like this that's less than a year old the uh rotors and i mean well, the drum brakes uh they it all comes off very easy um no major issues no real scoring um but anyway i'll do a video on that as well so what we're going to do here is just show you how to do one of these. The process is essentially the same for all four of them. Um, the first step starts with taking this uh, dust cap off of here. Highly recommend just using a simple rubber mallet. Uh, the kit that I got actually gives me a new dust cap, but I feel like that the... Uh, I like that these are actually labeled for the easy loop, and I feel like this is actually a little better cap. So I'm going to be a little gentle. There we go. You can see that's chuck full of grease right there. I'm gonna clean that up later. I'm not gonna do a video of me just cleaning that out. So now what you've got, you're gonna want a ton of rags for this type of a project. Um, but you got all the grease in here. Hopefully you got a bunch of grease in here and hopefully it's clean. This is a, you know only about a year old, so this should look good if they did everything right. And the first thing you'll see in here is this brass retainer clip. Uh, and this is a reusable clip, um, so you definitely want to take care in removing it. You don't want to just like chuck it into a trash can or anything like that. So it just pries right off. It's not really held on there with anything. And like I say, I'll clean that up a little later also. The next thing is a, the retainer nut. Um, this might throw some people off that like are used to working on other types of devices, but this retainer nut should be finger loose. Like I should just be able to spin it off right like that. That's how you know that it was actually installed correctly at the factory. Um, you basically just want it hand tight after you've made sure that it's cinched up good. 
but we'll do the video on how to tighten that back up. But if you can't just gently screw that off, then you might have a scorched bearing underneath. Again, I'll be reusing this and cleaning it up later. Next, what we've got in here is there is a washer. Um, the easiest way I've found to get these washers out is just two flathead screwdrivers and just being pretty gentle with it and just kind of slowly persuading it to come forward. And you can see it's D-shaped for the cutout in the, uh, in the spline. There you go. Again, this piece is reusable. I'm going to clean it up also separately. Now, there's kind of two choices. Um, I can either pull this whole thing off or I can take the outer bearing out first. I don't like greasy things dropping into my lap, so I'm just going to, again, very gently grab this with both sides. And this outer bearing should come right off. And should be nicely you know, chucked full of grease right there. So there, this bearing is actually replaced. The kit that I got came with a new one, so no need to clean and repack this one. I showed you how I packed them earlier. Now it's time for the uh, brake assembly itself. Um, if your unit is old, this may be difficult. If your unit is new, it should just slide right off of those splines. And of course, you want to be careful to not drop it or damage the splines or anything. Now you want to take a minute and inspect what this actually looks like here. Make sure that you don't see any scoring or any uh, any like marks or anything like that from where it's gone dry. Mine's brand new, so it shouldn't really have much going on with it, but you definitely want to clean it all the way up and take a look at it. You don't want to see any scoring marks, burn marks, gouges, anything like that, because this is you know what those bearings rotate against. Hmm, we've got a friendly spider living up in there. So this is actually how the old system works. This is the magnet unit, and uh, when you're pressing on your brakes, it activates this magnet, and in exchange, pushes these shoes out right here. Very old drum technology, already looks horrible, and as I said, really wasn't doing anything to impress me uh, with the stopping power. Um, before I remove the, the five bolts that are on here, I am gonna clip the wire in the back, so there is just, very easy clippers right here and I'm just gonna snip these right at the terminals um, I feel like doing it right at the terminals is friendly just in because I will zip tie these old wires up in case somebody was lost their mind and wanted to put drum style back on or maybe I ever encountered some sort of problem or something I don't want to completely remove all the wiring so I'm gonna snip these and eventually I'll just wire tie them up out of the way those terminals now we're free there Next is impact. So, five nuts holding the rest of this unit on here. I've been able to take them off so far with just a simple battery impact gun. It's not like they've been on with anything crazy. one you kind of got to push the wire up out of the way a little bit but again, nothing, nothing crazy nothing difficult and then the whole unit just slides right off again you want to be sure that you are not uh, dropping that right on the machine surface Let's see if anybody wants those on craigslist <laughs> Uh, I'm gonna go around again and just kind of generally clean this up. You can see how much junk already gets into these nicely machined surfaces that leaks through there. I'm gonna wipe this down probably several times because I don't want there to be any sort of junk in here. Um, the next step, oh, you got nothing on here. 
is to remove the kit actually includes five bolts so we're going to remove these five right here and they just hammer out real easy really nothing holding them in there now the step that i think a lot of people might not think about is especially on these easy lube systems is there still grease that exists from the zerk into the center unit where it comes out of here and where i'm using a slightly different type of grease um, i don't think i would have a compatibility problem but at the same time i just want completely fresh grease all the way through so i'm actually gonna put a couple pumps through here because my greases are different colors it's very easy for me to tell that i've got fresh grease prime through the system um, i would recommend that you always want to make sure that you're not trying to mix your greases or anything like that so this is your brake uh, brake holding plate right here. Uh, it actually clearly has stamped into it outside, meaning you went to the outside. And for the axle weight that I'm doing and the type of trailer that I have, uh, the recommendation is that the pads are always to the rear, whether you're on the left hand or right hand side. So again, I'm gonna put it on kind of carefully, make sure. And it's got a bunch of different holes in it because of course it's designed to, it's the same plate, whether it's on the right hand or left hand and they've given you these nice new bolts right here. Put all those in first like that. And then of course it comes with a little lock washer and then that lock washer on and tighten up our nuts. Now you're gonna see some different videos where people talk about torque on these. I am not gonna get into that fight. Um, everybody's got their opinion. Uh, if you look at the forums, you can see a lot of examples where people try to take these 50 and uh, these newer bolts just you know they're, they yield before 50 so I don't know that you necessarily want to do that but at the same time I don't want to get into a fight with anything on it so I'm not going to specify the exact torque that I'm tightening these to we'll just say that it is tight enough for the application based on what I have read so something that you may run into that I've seen on two of these axles so far is the weld height is not uniform as they're doing this weld at the factory and so that might actually cause you a little bit of issue getting this nut on. I actually have to kind of hold the nut up close and then thread the bolt through. Um, so this nut cannot freely spin against this weld right here. So just something that you kind of have to pay attention to as you're trying to get these in. So as you're torquing these, of course, you need to make sure and have your spanner wrench on the back side. And just like you would do wheels on your car or on the camper, you want to do a star pattern, working your way around so that you're getting good even clamping force all the way around. Um, this is not the time to try and just ballpark it. If you don't have a, have a click off torque wrench, you really, for these types of projects, need to make sure that you're getting the correct torque. So here is the router where I have already pre-pressed the inner bearing into and done an initial fill. seated on there nicely and then I'll go get my outer bearing and put it in there so here's our outer bearing and it gently goes into there and again I'm not worrying about packing uh, the inner portion of this because I have this easy lube right here that'll help me pack it through what I've done is I have put the outer bearing on and I've made sure that it's good and seated on there and now I'm gonna make sure that the entire cavity is filled with grease using the easy lube here um, this is really the only application for this easy lube if I so far I have used almost a half can of grease on each Hubs assembly packing the bearings and then filling the void So if you think that you're gonna push a half Can of grease just through here to maintenance your bearings. That's really not the way to do it This really should only be used as a top off and for doing at the fill and it's gonna be a while of pump in here in order to fill that entire cavity. And again, I've already pre-packed the bearings, so this is not packing the bearings, it's just filling the void between the two bearings. Pumping now, it's just starting to push the bearing forward, and you can kind of see a little bit coming through there. And I'm gonna give this a little rotation because it only has a filler on one side to make sure that I'm getting even pressure across there. And I'm gonna go ahead and put the nut on so that I'm not pushing the bearing out as I do the final fill on this. The way to tighten these down, is of course I already have the washer inside of there and I'm gonna always hand start this onto here 
And then I'm going to take an adjustable wrench. Keep getting it. And the idea is you do want to get it tight initially because what you're trying to do is make sure that your bearings are seated. And you can actually see that as I'm doing this, it had just been filling a lot of grease behind the bearing and now that's starting to push through also. So pretty much as tight as I can go right there and then back it off. Just like a quarter turn to where you can definitely still spin it by hand, um, but you don't want it actually tight, tight. And you want to check and make sure that you don't feel any free play or anything in here and that you've got rotation like that. And that's generally what you want it to look like. And now I'm going to do a final little extra fill at the end here and make sure that I'm packed all the way around. And you can see that grease just coming all the way around. Give it a little rotation. Make sure that it's packing all sides evenly. And that is a packed system right there. Now we will get our retainer clip back. Make sure, try and get it kind of cleaned off here from all the red type that was on there. I'm also not gonna get into a debate about what type of grease to use either because there's a million opinions on that. A lot of people use red and tacky. I don't think there's anything wrong with red and tacky. I just happen to choose to use a heavier duty version uh, from that same company but you'll find opinions on all sides of the issue. Now that this is cleaned off, one last just kind of sanity check on my right up against there. Feeling good. And then this of course has a little D shape in it to line right up to this nut right here. And the nut might have to move just a hair. If you're gonna move it, move it a hair back. You know, looser, not a hair tighter. <laughs> and that is the assembly back on there. Uh, of course, I will get some brake parts cleaner and wipe down this portion where like, I've touched it a little bit with my hands. Um, and then we'll move on to the brake lines. In terms of putting the brake caliper on itself, it slides right in. Um, the only real key point to it is you can't like rock in the top or rock in the bottom first. It just slides straight in. And then you've got these t two half inch lug bolts to go through. The torque is specified on these to be 50 foot pounds, so I'm going to cinch them up here with this ratcheting wrench and then I'll torque them off at 50 pounds each. Alright, let's talk wiring for a minute here. Uh, first off, I have to give complete and full credit to Rob Farrow or Faro. He posted uh, these electric over hydraulic instructions on the Grand Design uh, forum. Uh, from when he did it on his 2015 reflection 303 RLS and even though this is a 2020 and a half uh, it basically was almost identical and he saved me an absolute ton of time so thank you Rob I really 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 appreciate you posting those and I'll just give a couple updates so from the electricity side I've got all five wires tucked into this loom here and then I went ahead and branched it off up here uh, I am going to be looming. What you see there is the gray that comes with the kit and then a purple that I had to get more connectors over there. Uh, these little quick connects right here were quite nice. I liked them a lot better than the butt splices. And when we look up in the pin box, um, I'll let you know why I decided to go with those. Because I actually saw Grand Design using almost the exact same thing, just a different manufacturer. Uh, but these were cheaper on Amazon, so I decided to go with those. But it made doing the connections so much, e so much easier. Uh, also, if there's ever an issue, real easy to troubleshoot. You're not having to cut the butt cramps or anything like that. So I was really pleased with these. So again, I've got my brake uh, unit mounted here over on the side. I really like it because I'm not giving up anything. I'm not giving up like any of my storage space here or future potential area for where I want to put solar or anything or battery arrays for solar. Um, so moving around, I... The wires come down there. I did probably run myself too long a wire, but I wanted to leave myself some extra just in case. And then I went ahead and, as recommended, added the 40 amp circuit, just like he did right here for cutoff. I just te teed right off of the main 12 volt and then ran this little 40 amp and then the power coming off of there. Uh, and then the whites, actually, so you can see these guys right here. I'm still going to put one more screw in there, but these WACO controllers, and that's really what they're called, like WACOs, um, are what Grand Design is using now instead of, like, the crimp style or 
twist style or anything like that. And these are super easy to open and close and change up your wiring and it actually just had an extra slot. So I took advantage of that. Uh, I think the most brilliant thing, and, and I, I mean, I really don't use that word lightly, but Rob was really smart in how he figured out that because your existing brake line for the old system is in this red sheath in here, and inside of this red sheath is a blue and white uh, from the brake controller, and then the white also, that these aren't used. So you don't have to worry about fishing everything up to the pin box. You can just reuse those two wires because uh, you know this is where you clip it right here that's going to the old brake system that you're not even using it anymore so this is completely redundant so instead of having to worry about fishing wires up overhead and fooling with all that nonsense use the wires that are already there which is what I did and it made it very easy to tie into so going up into the pin box here This is where I took it apart and first saw these type of connectors here. And I was like, that is a really good idea. So like I said, I didn't get the exact same brand, but I got the similar content, just a little cheaper on Amazon. So the main thing that you have to do up here is the brake cutoff. So your brake cut switch right here was feeding in. One of them went to this blue series right here. And then the other one just went to the main power. The main power you leave alone. The blue one, you just cut it. And then I wrapped it since there would be an open terminal in there. And then I reused the uh, this wire right here going from the brake cutoff. And then this feeds eventually into where you have to get the brake cutoff signal. And then of course you'll be able to test that when you prime the system. It was just so clever to do that. And then I didn't have to fish anything up through here. I've already actually primed my system so I know that it functions correctly too. So really, Rob, really, really well done there. From a brake wiring standpoint, I kind of got a little creative right here too. Um, this punch right here already exists. And then I had an extra one of these uh, rubber grommets right here. So I actually just cut a hole out in the plastic one and then cut a hole into here to feed the soft brake line through. So I did not have to actually drill an additional hole through the side. This is where your uh, LP tank goes. I made sure to have plenty of clearance to it. So this is where I've got my soft line meeting up with my hard line. And then I did wrap my hard line the entire length in the, what I call COT, corrugated outer tubing, or some people call loom. And then that feeds down and goes underneath. Here's where I kind of do a little bit of an S pattern because I had just a little bit of length left over and it was not worth it to me to uh, completely cut and do a new um, flare on it just to take out this little bit of extra length that I had. So I just kind of do this little bit of an unusual travel, but no one will ever see it. It's not a big deal at all. And of course, removing this tray right here is really the key to the whole thing. So I didn't take it out of the camper. I just undid the screws and lifted it up so that I could then get access to this area. And it made it so much easier to straighten out my wire or my, uh, sorry, my brake hose from here. Now we'll go underneath the, the unit and I'll show you how I did that as well. As I ran my tubing down, this was the very first point in which I actually drilled a hole to set the hard lines in was this rearmost attachment. Uh, I did that so because I tucked everything neatly up underneath these brackets here all the way down and I wanted to make sure that I had enough length and travel and you know that the uh, flexible hose could move enough with the suspension that sort of thing and uh, so far I'm pretty pleased with the way it's turned out the other T is over there you can see something very similar with the attachment point right there and then COT protecting the whole thing all the way through as well so here I am the next day and I had hooked my truck up to the uh, camper and before I ever took off or did anything, the first thing I want to do, I knew that the emergency pull away switch definitely worked because that's how I primed the brake fluid and bled all the air out. But I hadn't actually checked whether my truck brake controller wiring was good or not. So when I hooked up, the first thing I did was just squeeze my brake controller right here and make sure that I could hear the pump kick on. If you hear the pump kick on, then you definitely know that you have um, good continuity to the brake system. So I did a real short drive around the neighborhood, um, making sure getting my gain settings right, that sort of thing, and I can tell a huge difference. I mean, before I had my controller set at eight and a half, 
It was basically a joke. It might as well have said 10. It, I really could never tell the difference. It didn't really do anything. Now with these, it's six and a half. I can absolutely feel the stopping power. So once I'd done my little test drive through the neighborhood, the first thing I did was look at all four rotors and make sure that I have, they're actually shiny because if the brake pads are working, it should have eaten away the initial kind of silver coating that the rotors come with. So I want to make sure that I was getting clamping force on all four rotors. So I've gone around and inspected for that. And then I also went to every single joint where there might be a brake line and shined a light on it and made sure that I did not have any leaks all the way through because you don't want to be going on a huge trip and be dripping brake fluid and end up with a real disaster on your hands. And then the very last step that I did was actually come in here and make sure that I had around the half or three eighths of an inch that it recommends below the line there of brake fluid still in the system. Make sure I didn't have any fluid drop. In total, it took me a little over a quart to fill the system. Now that's gonna vary a lot depending on how much you lose bleeding out the system. I did my first test run down to Nashville and back about 500 miles. And I was a little worried when I pressed this one bearing in. I was trying to use that socket method as opposed to the uh, wood block method. And I can definitely understand why people use the wood block method because it's easier to get this bearing on square. And I was a little worried that I have this truly square and on, and you can see it's a little undersunk and you can really see right there I actually had a little bit of leakage beyond the seal so unfortunately I've had to purchase a new seal take this back off and I'm gonna have to press this out and press it back in to correct this it only happened on this one after I learned my lesson I switched to the wood block on the other three and didn't have any issues getting this perfectly flush and haven't had any sort of seepage or leaking or anything like that either. But uh, definitely learned my lesson there. There's a reason they use the wood blocks. I was a little worried about little bits of contamination, but that's certainly a much smaller concern as compared to having the grease leak through the backside of the seal. So we'll get this pressed back out and back on. So I wanna close this out with just kind of talking about the project overall. Um, in general, the kit provided by Stop Your Trailer was a fairly nice kit. Uh, a couple things that I would improve on that was that the bracket for the brake actuator was not painted. So we painted that and mine was missing the hardware to actually mount the electric over hydraulic actuator to that bracket. Uh, but in general, I think this was a very doable job. It took me two full days, two full weekend days, a Saturday and a Sunday all day. And then I didn't want to just kind of post this and be done with it, but I really wanted to drive it and try it out and talk about what it felt like to have them on there. So we did about a 500 mile round trip down to Nashville and back. And the biggest difference is that I never thought about braking with the trailer. I never had those moments where it's, oh, is this a bit unsafe? Or, ooh, I can really feel the truck stopping me, but not the trailer itself. So I have a lot more confidence now. And uh, the following weekend, we also went down to another location. It was about probably only a 120 mile round trip or so. And again, it was a whole lot more confidence, a lot of small hills up and down and never did I feel like a trailer was pushing my truck forward. So these really do make a huge difference. And I would really, from a, as you're weighing your different options between what I want to tackle first, this is really a safety item to me. I, it's kind of unbelievable to me that they'll sell you a 10,000 pound plus trailer and not have disc brakes on it when the technology is pretty easy and it's pretty easy to do. Uh, the wiring that was provided, as I mentioned in the middle of the video, it made all the difference in the world. It made it super easy. We didn't have to fish anything through from the pin box forward. We were able to use the existing brake wires that were already in there. It made it very easy to do. Where I chose to mount this, I didn't have to trim off any of the excess at all and the hard brake lines. Uh, really the only other part that I added was the uh, boom or COT to coat those brake lines all the way down in the soft brake lines. But in general, I think this is a very doable project. I wouldn't be scared of it. Uh, if you're trying to tackle it, feel free to hit me with some comments below. I'll provide whatever expertise I can to help anybody get through it. Basically, if you can change out a caliper on your car, you can do this type of project. Appreciate everybody watching today. Leave me some comments. Love the feedback. Love to help anybody if I can. And uh, thanks for watching.